There's no homogenous path towards making the crowd sound real. It's like, it's gotta be this chaos. And it is like what Paul said, it's theater. And that's the most fascinating thing about it because like I loved wrestling growing up, but I took a long hiatus. I mean, until I started doing this movie and then I was watching it. My YouTube algorithm is so fucked up now. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time and being here. I'm very excited to talk to everybody here about The Iron Claw. I saw the film yesterday and I was just like struck by how emotional and how effective it was as a film that shows the plight of this family and what they went through and the dynamics between the brothers. It was just really great. First of all, congratulations to everybody on their work. But I do want to frame this conversation around sound in a lot of respects. Me personally, as a picture editor and a sound editor, I'm always constantly talking about or thinking about how sound is so important to the process that we all work on. And I want to talk about how we use sound from the picture edit stage with Matt to tell the story, to bring about like kind of what the goals are with the director and the script and the performances. And also when he gets into the edit mix stage and how that then becomes a reflection of what the goals were initially from the director. Before I start that and start how that collaboration works, I want to actually just ask Matt, when you started the film and you started working on it, I don't know if you can speak a little bit about the process with Sean Durkin and what your goals were with the film, what it, what it was you were trying to achieve in the edit. You know, it changes. It changes th through the whole experience of the cut. And, you know, it's a big story. It was the first time I think I've ever done like a saga or something. Most of the movies that I've done are sort of like single character stories or, or like, you know, tighter perspective. And I mean, I don't know that there was a goal so much as, you know, Sean had been working on the script for a long time and we had this big family. And I think the process of editing the movie really became focused on the character of these people and the balance of, of how the family motivates the story, which is sort of similar to the film that we all did previously together, The Nest, which was a similar thing. And I think the, the, the most fascinating realization, even though it was like small and simple, was that the movie was really just about the brothers, not about the family. And that became clear earlier when we started screening. You know, we did three test screenings and there was a lot of discussion about brothers and we kind of realized that that's where the cut needed to focus which seems obvious when you see the movie but actually you know it's always the case that you kind of realize something really basic and then once you make that realization you can't go back and the other thing that was really interesting is we had these 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 hot boys you know and and realizing that there was there was a lot of stuff that we we're looking at where like people want to see the bear so they want to like have him in the movie earlier and it was a game of like he's not actually there that's the point and the, and the edit is a really interesting place to embody embody the narrative with the actual structure in the film because everyone was like is there any way to get him jeremy allen white in the movie like pre-credits you know like before 824 you just have the bear in there that'd be great and and it was interesting to to push that off and have the satisfaction of this like this guy showing up, you know, which is a function of great casting and putting in and and luck that he became this person because he was always going to be Carrie, I think, I think, and so it was just about pu pushing that storyline, like really narrowing in on the brothers' relationship and and it, we had to to make it work, you know, like there's certain things that happen later in the movie that are a bit of a a bit of a reach and the stronger we got the relationships the better it worked when we were driving towards the end of the movie so that was really like the overall experience of the of the cut on this on the story side was just really focusing the movie on kevin and the relationship he has with his brothers which is great i mean it was great because there was a really good interesting steady performance from Zach. And so that was something that you could really like use as the tree trunk and branch off 
all these little stories because it's kind of hard when you leave your main character to keep everyone engaged right and so that was sort of the thing was like how often do we go into these other brothers lives which you need to do in order to sort of bring them back into the story but it was, it was like it was really a game of of balancing i would imagine in your edit like a lot of things had shifted around and had to be kind of like little puzzle pieces kind of shifted around to in order to achieve that and all the things that you were trying to talk about yeah there's definitely version there's versions of this movie you know and as always is like i i found that a lot of it and i find this often you're in, like sort of towards the end of of it and you're like should we should put that there and and the guy and he's like yeah that's where it's supposed to go i was like oh i wonder someone must have wrote it for that reason you know it's like it's always this thing where you you kind of you really get you you get flexy and you want to put you want to like really make it like a thing and then often that i think helps you see the the trees in the forest and 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 cut out stuff that's getting in the way of telling your story and you know the 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 pieces often fall back into place in in an interesting way there was some moving around of like when and how things happened and and sort of like structuring to to bring story points forward and and like omissions in the movie like you know obviously you always have to cut stuff out for one reason or another and some of the paring down made these really incredible juxtapositions of scenes that sort of became stronger than the content that you would have been in between, you know? So it, it was, yeah, it was a lot of juggling and, and, you know, repair, repairing what was originally intended once we'd sort of like cleared out some of the stuff that was getting in the way. You know, the, the one thing I, I always say when, when in the picture edit suite or just talking about picture editing altogether is like, we're focusing a lot on like the performances and the story structure and like, you know, the framing and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I always say that 50% of picture editing is sound editing. Can you speak a little bit about your philosophy with, in terms of sound when you are in the edit and you're kind of on your own with your editorial crew and you're working through it and how you're working to kind of help or get sound to help you support everything that you're trying to achieve as you're trying to tell the story with Sean? Yeah, I mean, m much to the suffering of my friends on this call, I really, I spend a lot of time on it. And it's sort of my... Like, I kind of often think of myself as a failed sound designer because I just, like, I I love, I love the sound in movies so much. And I think, for me, it becomes a way to think about the story. And, you know, my process is always, I'll put the scenes together roughly, but I don't, until, I don't really start working on them until I can get a sequence together because I find sequences are where I understand how the movie's going to work and how scene to scene things can play and scene to scene is where sound comes into it for me because I'm like a real melty kind of like I really like I like sound to be really melty and 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 stretch across the whole movie and I, I like to think about that in a big picture and I always have sort of bigger ideas that get pared down into like kind of not ideas but just the movie telling me what what to do and sometimes there's scenes like you know, one of the last things that I kept pushing Matt on in the edit was this this weird scene where, like, the, this church choir is coming up over top of the stairs as they're greeting everyone. And it was, like, this idea that made that staircase scene into what it is. Because without it, it's kind of... Like, when it first started in the cut, it was just like, hey, how you doing? And everyone's there. But then once we figured out what the sound was going to be, because originally it was going to be a sermon, and it was this whole different church thing, but we were left with this choir. And, and like, that wasn't something... That was just something that we came up with. And I think it brings this tension to it, you know? And I think it is, like you say, like, the biggest... It is absolutely half of the storytelling. And often it's all... It's the whole storytelling, I try to think of my job during the edit to be creating a general concept for how sound will work in the movie. And then that's where I look I look forward to working with the sound team. And a couple times I've been able to bring on Paul and Brennan. Brennan on another project much earlier. Two projects he came on much earlier. Because I just didn't have the skills to do what I needed to make it work. And that's like something that I, I'm working towards. And there's been a couple of times where I've skipped having a second assistant editor and brought on a sound editor with that money because I just don't think like I don't have the ability I don't have the technical 
ability or or like the intuition or whatever like experience all of it i just don't know how to do it properly i know how to rough it in and shape it out and so for me sometimes i I really think okay if i had the sound i wanted then the scene would work and to find out if that's true i think like i need it rather than just like waiting because i kind of have this thing that either i go all in on sound in the edit and really try to come up with an idea that we can work from or i don't do anything and for me not doing anything is not possible because i just can't i can't I don't have the engine for that. You know, I think other generations of editors who only had two tracks of sound or whatever, they can go through a career working with like mono tracks and whatever, but I don't have that brain. My brain needs the full experience. And Sean does too. Like he beat me down on like hit sound effects. And really the movie didn't start to come together until we got a demo, like a temp track of wrestling, which happened quite early on. And then we would bring that in. And then I would work with that because suddenly these scenes come to life. So really it's just about designing some kind of concept that supports the, the narrative structure and the, and the progression and, and fills the world out so we can create the best opportunity for a great soundtrack in the end. It's just for me the most important thing when I know my sound team and like these guys, you know, we've been making movies together for, you know, Chan and I for 15, almost 20 years now. And and, and Paul and Martin and Brennan for, I don't know, 10, like I, or like, I don't know if Brennan's yet 10 years old, but, um, yeah. we, we had a lot of, we've spent a lot of time working together. And so for me, just knowing that I don't have to say, Hey, sorry, I'm an asshole. I really just, you know, like I just, for me, it's amazing to have people that are your partners who are going to come into it and be like, okay, I know what to do. We've done this before. And they also are doing stuff that's not going to be thrown away later, which is always my pitch. Like, let's not start from scratch. Like, let's get going now. Hey, Brandon, can you speak a little bit about what that's like being involved this like much earlier than what, like, you know, before Picture Lock and they're still trying to form a story and they're asking you for stuff. Like, well, what's, what's that like for you as a, as you know, as an editor, as somebody that's trying to craft? Yeah, it's a a fortunate experience where the conversations about the tone of the film and the shape of the film and all these things that Matt's talking about, they start much earlier. So you, you get this kind of feedback loop between yourself and the editor on, you know, how far off the mark are you? Or this is working, this is not working. And it was especially interesting with this film. Like we knew that there was going to be a high level of verisimilitude. Like we're, the, the hits are going to sound like they're hits and they're going to be in that space. And you know, we didn't know how far we were going to go in each direction. Like Matt was always saying, you know, we, we want the crowd and and the energy to kind of be overpowering, like you're, everything is going to get drowned out. And I think we started in a much more extreme version of that. Like I basically got the opportunity to do these kind of stems for Matt. So I did crowd and chanting and, and the hits and all that, condensed them into stems and gave them back to Hannum, who was then able to remix those to his liking and to his taste. And he was working in 5.1 with Sean, which is super cool, because then he's getting that immersive experience that he's talking about. So that was like a really unique position for us to be in. And that really progressed in different ways. And I can let others speak to that because they were more part of how things evolved. But it was it was great to have a starting point, you know, during picture editing before proper sound even began. In the stage where the sound department officially starts and you have, you guys have your first meeting with, with Sean and with Matt and dual sh- sound spotting, what were the kind of things that you remember Sean was sharing in terms of what it was, what the objective was in terms of what he wanted the sound to do? Can anybody, like it doesn't matter who, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, Sean doesn't, isn't like super specific i find like he's more just talks about it from a place of feeling which is kind of freeing in a way he's not super instructive about what specific kinds of sounds or what the type of sound that something would make he's just like i want to like when you would talk about the fritz match which is the first match in the film he'd be like violent bloody messy he'd just say all these words and be like okay yep yep that lines up it's nice to work with him that way and it's also really great to work with matt as well and in the cut because all of these strong sound ideas that are in the film, there's so many that are originated in the edit and they couldn't be manufactured after the edit. Like they're they're embedded in the cut. There's like things like the church. There's things like how 
when um, Kevin walks down the aisle with the Ric Flair match, like that's that's in the like that's built into like the edit, and you you couldn't just paste that on it afterwards with a bunch of sound effects. The thing that I wanted to ask about is for Martin in terms of the the production recordings and everything that you've got from set. Can you speak a little bit about what they were like and if there were any challenges or if there are any sort of like golden things that was delivered to you that just made things like, you know, kind of easy for you or was it, was it like, you know, challenging? And I mean, the main thing about the production recordings was that they were really, really good. Uh, it was a guy called Paul Ledford who uh, has done a, bu- a bunch of work with Soderbergh actually. And the re- really excellent recordings. The main thing that he did that was very interesting was that he had microphones all over the place. So if you had a dialogue scene in the kitchen, he even had microphones on the on the on the road outside the ranch or in you know two two rooms away. So uh, you know obviously that those ones weren't necessarily that useful to us, but they were they were good for us. That, establishing the sound of, of the environment but we you know we, we we didn't really use those ones where it was fantastic was it was in in all of the wrestling scenes so in in the sports auditorium when, when whenever there was a wrestling ring he was recording midside he was recording the environment in the theater in the auditorium so you were getting midside's recording of the of the crowd of all of the atmosphere and the impact but the incredible thing was that he had mics around the ring and under the ring. So the mic under the ring, you weren't getting so much crowd, but you were getting all of the impact. I can imagine that getting the sound of the arena and the crowd and those hits and everything else and getting them right and authentic um, would have been not an easy task to say well, the it least. Wasn't, it wasn't easy. It was so yeah. hard. We worked on the crowd. It's like everything else was done in a week. It's like we worked on the crowd constantly it was so hard yeah that was definitely the impression that i got it was yeah. in watching the film it was like oh yeah this is a lot of work we talked a lot about a lot of different things like a uh, even outside of talking with sean and matt paul i think had gone and started calling around the city to be like are there wrestling rings we could record at i was trying to figure out how to record women because what we had coming from the sound effects and even when we got some of the loop group, it seemed fairly male dominated. And when I went back and watched 80s wrestling matches, all you can hear is screaming. I'm like, oh, my God, we need to have a screaming. And thankfully, we didn't need that. And when I tried that, it, it just didn't work. It made it a little bit cartoonish and ridiculous. But I was talking to this woman who's a roller derby professional. And she's like, oh, yeah, the girls in my my matches are super rowdy. So we we're going to go record them. But yeah, the crowd so many aspects but it was also that sound of the of the women it was so, it's 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 a real it's a real texture it's a real flavor because when, whenever you went back to listen to those broadcast recordings the you the the screaming was really really evident it's part of the story it's part of the plot the von eric boys were they were like pop idols women would so many of them would go to these matches cuz you know they they loved these the von eric boys and that that set, that screaming sound it's like a Beatlemania thing. I, you know, we had to be very careful with it, mix-wise, because, you know, ob- obviously it's very it's very wearing. But it's it's such a great element to have in there. And I, but, I, you know, and I almost killed my loop group ladies getting 30 seconds of pure screaming, which I felt really bad about. Yeah, which we peppered in lately, which is good. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Paul, I'm wondering where he, whether you can speak about, with the film being set, in the 80s and it's like you know technically a period piece how much work did you have to do like i mean you went through arenas and you're trying to find like you know kind of the proper sound but was there anything specific that you can speak on that you felt you had to kind of that was surprised to you in terms of oh it's got to be like that just just like matt said with yeah women in the crowd yeah yeah this all goes back to you brought up our first meeting with with sean and 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 matt about our approach and i think brennan used the word verisimilitude and and that trying to be authentic was really important. It's, it's part of Sean's approach to filmmaking. And so, but at the same time, we're not doing doing a documentary. So it was trying to research what were the actual sounds that you'd hear in an arena. I think you know Sean's a big wrestling fan, and he wanted real wrestling fans watching the movie to to feel like it sounded familiar to them. So yeah, we had to dig down in that. One of the first things I did was I called the wrestling uh, expert that you guys had on set, Chavo 
Guerrero, who used to be a professional wrestler, retired now, but he was the consultant on the shoot. And he actually plays a role in the film. He plays the Sheik, I believe, uh, in, in one of the early matches. And I had a great chat with him about, about the ring itself because we were, you know, we were thinking, man, we're going to have to like either, either, you know, rent a real wrestling arena and record the ring or build it ourselves with, uh, with, along with the Foley team, da, 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 da. But Chavo told me that there, there is no standard way the rings are built. Generally, they're metal frames with wood planks on top and vinyl padding, ropes that are taped up. But beyond that, it's kind of like a free-for-all, and people just do their own thing. So that kind of freed us up right away to think, okay, the ring doesn't have to have a super specific sound, but at least now we know what the materials are. Martin and Brennan dug up these recordings from under the ring, so we had that as a real reference to, uh, for, for just the sound of the ring. So that was a key thing to get. Uh, and also talking to Chavo about the kinds of sounds the wrestlers make in the ring and, and the sort of idea that they're trying to sell the idea that they're hurting each other, but it's actually the opposite. They're trying to prevent each other from being injured. So there's a lot of this thing they do, they call it a bump when they hit the mat with their foot, say, while they're striking an opponent. And you hear this big bang sound. So learning about that and what that sound was. And then I did a lot of watching, like everyone else, a lot of old wrestling matches from the 80s. We were able to find quite a few with the brothers and really paying attention to what those matches sounded like. You know, what the hits sounded like. They tended to be very, very slappy with, with bass, but not, not like a typical punch sound. And maybe the most important part was the crowds themselves, which which had this crazy, almost hysterical energy to them. And yeah, a lot of women screaming. We started digging into that. And what I found really helpful was understanding the psychology, the general psychology of those crowds. And, and I, probably the best resource I came across was an old, I think it was 60 Minutes segment about wrestling crowds. And, you know, and it was kind of this question of like, why, do, why do people love this so much? Why are they so passionate? And they interviewed, you know, a whole bunch of wrestling fans. And a lot of them were pretty articulate about it in that they were saying, we know it's not real, but, you know, we have uh, our frustrations in our real lives and, and, you know, life is difficult and maybe it's unfair. And they get to come to the ring and pour all of that energy into this, you know, theatrical spectacle. And, and so that's, that's the psychology of what's going on there. And it explains why, you know, they're, full-throated shouting like screw you and da 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 but you also have your you have your guys right like there's it's like there was really interesting things like if you remember the rick flair match we had 30 percent flair fans you know and it's like you can't it's like the heel has has fans and it's a really interesting balance there's no homogenous path towards making the crowd sound real it's like it's got to be this chaos and it is like what Paul said, it's theater. And that's the most fascinating thing about it. Because like, I loved wrestling growing up, but I took a long hiatus. I mean, until I started doing this movie and then I was watching it. My YouTube algorithm is so fucked up now. It's yeah. like, it's like if anyone opened my phone and looked at YouTube, it's like all these dudes and like, you know. But I, I, I think it's, I read this thing early on that really explained something to me and, and was the key for me to a lot of the film. And it's the first essay in Roland Barthes mythology is, is about wrestling. And I couldn't believe it. Like I, I opened it up and I was reading it. And there's this quote that is exactly what Paul's talking about, which is like, and it's written in the 50s by a French guy. So they're talking about judo. And he's like, in judo, a man who's down is truly down, but he's also trying to get up, right? But in wrestling, a man who's down is down and is going to tell you that he's down. And re like wrestling crowds don't work unless someone's yelling, get up. The crowd is what's driving it because they can't do it at the pace that anything like this would ever happen, right? It's like a live comedy show. You need to give time for laughter because if people aren't a part of it, it doesn't work. And, and the fascinating thing about the mat is I had the hardest time figuring out how to cut the initial sound effects because they're not really in sync because the hit always comes just like a split second before because they're stamping on the floor to make, to draw your attention away from the fact that they're not actually hitting each other. Although 
Kevin did actually hit people is an amazing fact. He, that everyone hated fighting him because he just punched people in the face. It, it's total theater. And that's, I think, the most fun thing about creating the crowds and the fights is that you're actually designing something that is like the sound of wrestling. The mat is designed to tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the most amazing thing about this. The, the mix for me was the way that it works. Like the, my favorite scene in the movie is this one shot where Kevin's doing the rope bounces where he's like going back and forth across the ring. I like check the slate. I resunk it so many times because the sound doesn't make any sense when you look at the picture. The ring is so tight for those ropes to work, for those steel cables to work. They have to be super tight so they're not really making a sound. And the sound is all like he's jumping early. And you you want the sound to be hitting the rope but the sound is actually his feet on the floor. And it's I think it's like the biggest it's the smallest massive challenge for the sound is to create a synchronized soundtrack that is not in physical sync, but it's in emotional sync, you know, and the crowds needed to be that too. They, they couldn't be as loud as we wanted them because then you couldn't hear anything. And so Matt and Paul, I don't know, like whoever, I don't know who did the that work, like everyone really, it was a crew, but creating those crowds, they had to sort of work, I think, so hard in the background to sonically make space to actually hear them because if you put all the sound in it's like nothing you couldn't it was totally annoying and deafening but it was that was a really fascinating thing making that a that ring sound sound the way it should yeah well i think it you know real wrestling matches often you don't hear you don't hear them hitting each other and you barely hear them vocalizing because the crowd is so loud so and so obviously to tell a story effectively, we had to find a, bit, a different balance than that. What seemed to help was making the crowd sound smaller than it really was or, or that we'd be depicting. So in other words, hearing more individual voices poking through. But back to what Matt was saying, there is this story or, or they call it an angle in wrestling or it's an arc that's supposed to happen across the match where, you know, your hero is succeeding and then he's failing and then he's succeeding and then... The, the bad guy or the heel does something really despicable to try to get an advantage. And the whole goal is to get the crowd doing this all the way through and then reaching this cathartic peak when hopefully the good guy wins or whatever. So that, that just took many, many, many passes in editing and then in mixing just to get all those little waves of emotion working. Right. Did you ever find out, did you ever talk to us about what that's called? We had it written on the board for a while because we couldn't figure out how to edit these matches without including everything, right? And one of the things we we talked to Chavo, or Sean did, and there's like, a, I can't remember all of it anymore, but it, wrestling is, I think, fi in five acts, a match is in five acts. And it's like, there's something called the shine, which is where the, the, the hero has to show off a little bit and then they get beaten up and then they have to come back. And like the match doesn't work without a comeback. And that's actually how we cut because no one could accept a, a full length match to open because the, the movie starts with these two matches. Right. And we ended up cutting the chic match into like segments, but they were actually just those things that Paul's talking about in quick succession, jump cut from him losing to him coming back. And the length of things had to be designed in order to like, emulate that narrative arc which is incredible to me and those cuts only worked because of sound because it was all on like him grating his head across the rope and and then like coming back on a punch it's like really a bullet point of the match and that only works because you have these loud cuts and these deafening silence like oh you know it's it's really a big sound thing it's like all it's all that yeah, it, it's the whole storytelling is about the crowd reacting and telling people what's going on. Cause like, what's this guy? Is the guy biting his head? Like what is going on? That is that real? Like it, but you know, if you just heard teeth in hair, it wouldn't work. So it has to be a crowd going, Oh, that's really bad. Don't do that to this guy. He's nice. You no, know? this film really made me think about, I think it's a universal truth in like a lot of different forms, be it art, marketing, like, anything but in storytelling sound like that idea of contrast absolutely has to exist like you cannot have something be accentuated there can't be the comeback unless there's that preemptive loss first there can't be a crowd reaction that moves you if there's a steady 
energy and roar from the audience that never dies down. And that's the thing. When I first did these crowds, I felt like I really failed you guys because <laughs> I followed I followed Hanum's like bold inspiration where we would like for those first few months, the two of us were just a so like a wall of sound the whole time. And it felt great when you're just watching those three minutes and you're in, you know, you're surrounded by your five speakers and it's great. But but to to have the arc of that storytelling of a given match and, and furthermore throughout an entire movie, it doesn't work if it's just in your face the whole time. The mixers really took it to a new level in terms of understanding like it's gotta be more the reactions from the crowd. And that's what's gonna allow this shape and this storytelling to happen. You're being hard on yourself. We had to go through this process and that's what it was. And yeah, at first, like, you know, you guys did a whole bunch of work and Matt and I sat with it. And I, f I think our first reaction was like, wow, that's amazing. And then we listened to it again and we started to see the issues like that you're talking about that we're not getting the peace peaks and valleys. We're not getting this emotional reaction that we want, you know, from, from the, so yeah, it was this organic process we just had to go through to get where we ended up. Yeah. Because we couldn't make it sound like broadcast wrestling. Graham Rogers, who did all this crowd work, the effects mixer, he was saying the other day is like, you know, you go to like a baseball stadium and listen to the crowd. It sounds awful. Like you don't want to make it sound real. So it's got to live in this space. Like we knew the crowd had to tell the whole story. And yeah, you're right. It just took a lot, long time to get there. It started with a kind of brick wall of sound. We're like, yeah, this is really awesome. And then by the end of the movie, we're like, oh, well, we're deaf and we haven't learned anything. And then, yeah, Paul came and he's like, well, really, let's just try and focus on the people around the ring. And I think once we really started to go there. It got really good. And then that was around the time when we started to figure out how to use the loop group, which wasn't using its for its specificity, but we saturated it. So it had this kind of extra textural aspect to it. Because in my head, I was like, I, I want to hear the screaming like in a really reverberant space and I don't want it to sound clean and I don't want it to sound like, you know, a person in front of a microphone. So when we figured out this way to process it, it just kind of like added this extra like layer and texture inside of the the crowd. And so all those things were working together and then Graham had to weave them all in and out of each other like constantly. I think it helped too when we did loop group, like Martin and I, uh, Martin ran the loop group, but we went back and forth quite a bit about, you know, what kinds of things do we want them yelling out? And I don't know if any, much of that comes through in the film, but I think the emotional kind of tone does come through. And that goes back to what Matt Hannum was saying about that Barth's essay about wrestling, that it's it's designed to make people think about justice, that justice is being done up there. And so there are a lot of lines that we gave to Loop Group along the lines of make him pay, you know, and <laughs> that, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I think that energy was really a key thing for us to nail to get that, that feeling right. In my younger days, I used to watch wrestling a lot too. And in watching the movie in the theater, I found myself getting kind of caught up and lost in like away from what the story was I was watching, but into the match. <laughs> and I think a lot of that has to do with what Matt was talking about, about the structure of it. Cause I could almost like anticipate, Oh no, he's down, but I know this is, this is when he's going to get up. And it was fun to kind of relive that for me. So I, I thought emotionally everybody here did like such a great job in capturing that and embodying what it's like in those days in the 80s, watching a wrestling match and watching it unfold and kind of having that feeling of excitement. And all the matches were like that for me, especially in the Flair one. I was just like, oh my God, this is so good. But Matt, I wanted to ask you in terms of like, you know, because out of anybody here, you've lived with, with the film the longest in a sense. Was there something that, that you can remember that surprised you in terms of the sound that was kind of from the initial concept had changed so much that you discovered through the process with everybody here. Kind of all of it always surprises me because, I mean, that's not a good answer, but going through the movie, technically speaking, the soundtrack on the bottom is the most complicated part of my job, right? Because I have like, you know, between 20 and 30 tracks playing and it becomes this thing where it kind of just becomes a fact. And I'm trying to preserve what, what's been done because you don't want to remix the whole thing every time. And every time I go into a mix, I'm just so amazed what quiet can do. Because like when you're editing, I think any kind of, especially in features, I think 
you become so inured to the to the to the movie's capability of capturing your attention, right? And I think that one of the things that you forget is that not every scene has to have fucking radiators and TVs, radios in the next room, like all this shit that keeps me interested and keep me going. But really, like, why is it so interesting? Why does ASMR work? It's like a single sound can really capture the attention. And when I came back to hear the movie, and especially because we worked together a bunch before, there wasn't really a long ways to go in reinventing how this movie was going to sound. They kind of, and, and when you trust each other, I think that it's, it's really easy. Like I have a problem, like I have a real problem because it's hard for me to re-see the movie, to rehear it, you know, because it's like, I understand how this movie works because I did it for, I don't, I, I, we cut, I cut this movie from October through whenever, like the summertime, you know, like it was a really long process. And so you start to understand, like, this is how this movie works. And when you trust someone to sort of rethink it, like, for me, the, the end of the Ric Flair match is something that I had baked into my head that it had to be this like, <laughs> till it cuts, you know, and there's quite a few scenes where you l lean back on the energy that a hard cut can make and actually creating quiet and peacefulness and like definition, because definition is something that I don't think you can achieve in a, in offline edit because I don't have the ability or the, you know, intelligence to, to like the sonic intelligence to, to do it. And you also don't have the distance. And so for me, the, the most exciting thing of mixing this movie was going from these insane crowds to the simplicity of a dialogue scene. Every time, like there's this long first date scene with Pam and Kevin and everyone in the, before we we're cutting, it was like, cut it down, cut it down, cut it down. And then once we'd done a first pass of sound and stuff, we went back and put stuff back in the movie because we realized you can sustain, you know? And I think that's the thing that, that sound in a film does, it sustains your attention. It tells you where to look and listen, right? Like, and there's certain things like perspective that I'm so dogmatic about perspective when I'm cutting because I have to, I have to understand what it's doing. And there's this really simple and beautiful shot where there's like people training and wrestling in the foreground and Kevin is up in the tiny window and for me to like make that shot work, I was like, okay, all the sound is in the office. We can't hear them down here. It's like this whole thing. And then when I came into the mix, it was all playing at regular vault. Like it was all playing and it was so much better because it was engaging where I had it as like instructional, like here's where to look They're here, you know, this, and that's the thing that I, I think is so revelatory about, about a mix is definition perspective and the, and the literal mix of where you hear things you know, silence, quiet, loud, the dynamics between scenes, like that's something that we work on so much in, in the mix is the dynamics, right? And the way that a meta meta scene, like a meta sound or, or a psychological soundscape or a psychological place, you know, there's all these montages that I only know how to do because of learning about sound in the mixing and getting to mix with people and, and who are generous enough to tell you, you know, like, not all sound teams are as good as these guys. A lot of times you go in and the work's done and you have a week to mix it. And you're like, what? Wait a second. What? And like, you know, I've had experience where I had to go into a sound mix because the director's like, I don't know what you did and I don't know what they're doing. And so I need you to, need you to explain it to them. And then you go in and you talk to these guys and it's like, that's not how we do it. And I'm like, what do you mean? That's not how you do it, but it's cause it's like this factory approach in some places. Right. But with having artists, like these guys are artists, like, like the research that Martin does about what people say and how they should sound is unbelievable. The guy is a dialogue genius. You know, he, he, he takes it on like it's a character. And the, and the previous film we did was in America and in England. And like the attention to this guy's talking about where these people will be from because of their accents. You know, or the wrestling, there'd be things like, oh yeah, that's what they actually said when Kevin came in. I was like, you know, like he's, he's bringing it, you know, and, or like Paul goes and records, like re-records sounds for me and Brennan makes, makes things up. <laughs> like, you know, he, he records stuffs and, and stuff and creates things. And then Chan is like the very finest at 
actually not just doing it the way that it's supposed to be done. He performs the movie in sound, you know? And so for me, the, the joy of having this last creative sprint rather than just like leveling the sound out and like making it sound good. And like, I mean, I still have to fight him about dialogue not having to be as clear as one would like ideally want it to be. But then there's the other side of it where you see like a Nolan movie and you don't know what the hell is anyone saying. And it's an idea, but if you don't have someone to tell you it's it's like not a great idea to like not hear what the characters are saying, you need this like really strong force to finish the movie out. Because if you don't, you just replicate the offline or regenerate the sound. The one thing that, you know, kind of isn't really represented here, but I don't know if Matt Chan can maybe speak a little bit about it is music. And if there was anything that he could speak on regarding how music affected the approach to the film. Sean is extremely precise with music and he worked very, very closely uh, as does Matt Hannum with, uh, in this case, it was Richard Reed Perry and Petro Amato. So when it gets to me, it's pretty much like as intended. That's and not it's... true though, man. Like if you think about it, the crowds again, think about how hard we had to work to hear the music and the crowds. You really had to make sure. choices. Sure. I, I mean, you know? I guess, I, yeah, there, in the wrestling matches, absolutely like that. But that that was going to be the case no matter uh, what we did. And, the, you know, there's a couple of the cues where we had to work pretty hard. But I mean, generally speaking, like the way it comes in is the way you, you've you heard it all before. It's not a surprise, which is really great. That doesn't happen on most films, to be honest. I would say in this particular scenario, the music was pretty easy to put in to the film. Something that we've done on the last two movies, though, is is worked with mixes more than I ever have before, yeah. right? Like yeah. having the score mixed. It's something that you don't always get. Yeah, it's actually kind of unusual. And especially, you know, we talked about it on this film, like Richard loves compression. So his stuff was coming in very compressed, but it just sounded really good. So I was like, I can't really justify going to the stems that don't sound as well mixed and glued together as the mixes. Well, because they bust it all back through a Neve analog mixing board and yeah. we record the stems, yeah. right? It's a really, it's a really like interesting process. They have yeah. this studio in Montreal and we went and made the score. We worked with them only for a few days. Like most of it was long distance, but when they re-record it, like there was this bass sound that I've dug out of the stems and brought back in and they were like, oh, you like that? Cool. And it's the bass direct into this weird amp, like weird digital outboard amp thing that has this like like this fuzzy sound and that stuff that we you guys really like went in the mix like you made space for the for the music to sort of surge and take over like the crowd like everything we talked about right yeah yeah and then sometimes we made it inaudible <laughs> like it was a really it's a really dynamic music mix could you actually talk about the song because i don't even know if we've ever really talked about this the song in the film is amazing and it plays such an important role can you talk about you know, the evolution of it when you first heard it, how it was written? There's something that I don't know for sure, and I hope we never know. Like, did it exist before? Did they write it for this movie? It's not clear. But Rich's partner, her name's Laurel. She has a band called Little Scream. And it's something that they wrote together. And Sean was talking about how there needed to be a song. And Rich was like, I think we have something for you. And so we had a demo. The demo was like an iPhone recording of this tune. They broke it down. So we had an instruction kit for how it's played. And then Stanley, who is a bass player in a in an actual band with his brothers. So he learned the song. The band had to learn the song. The sound mixer recordist guy was a real trip. He's like an old school guy. He had like a, a plan. And I talked to him a lot. Like we talked about mic placement with Matt and all these things. And then we talked about this thing. And he really wanted to do it as playback. And Sean refused. And so we recorded the song live in all of its instances. Like my favorite movie, uh, Les Mis, you know, I wanted to... That was a joke. Um, I, I, I was really like... Uh, we, we were really excited to, to do it for real. And so the recordings weren't that great. But we wanted it to seem legitimate and real. And that was like a real mixing feat for Matt was taking that recording and making it sound good, but making it sound real, you know? And that was the really cool thing is that these guys have learned how to play the song so they could perform it. And all of the performances are more like, I did a little bit of funny business, but it's mostly like the live take. So we had a, like a session of all the 
mics in the room and then and there were no overdubs or anything it was just like it was live and i think it sounds amazing for that reason you know i mean but it was hard to recreate my especially in the party scene like that wasn't an easy thing yeah it was tricky but i mean the recordings were great the performance was great so as soon as you sent me the multi-mic which was before we started mixing and I, I knew we were just have to make it work and it did there was definitely an authenticity to that yeah moment in the in the film that just made you really root for Mike. And I think that's one of the things that made his story in the film that much more devastating when you can kind of see him in, in, that, in his element and then, you know, it all goes to shit. And, and, and then at the end when the, we got the master for the song, like it wasn't quite the master. We got like a version of the final song you hear that rolls into the credits, like on the second last day of mix. I hadn't heard it. I was just like, where's the song? And I was like, oh, it's coming, it's coming. And then it showed up. And I just remember I sat for two hours pretending to mix the song, just listening <laughs> to it as loud as possible. Because <laughs> wow. it was just so good and mm -hmm. just so it's emotional so to hear it. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. For sure. And they also, you know what else they did in remembering is that they used that song to develop a lot of the music that we hear in the film. The themes, Like yeah. a lot of the themes are in the score subtly or not so subtly. We worked on the themes a lot with them and like there's not a lot of them. Like it's all sort of in this similar thematic place but because mike had this like band thing we wanted to design a, a piece of the score that started out in a certain way and evolved so like the 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 music that we hear in the chic is like the brother's music is what we called it so the music was like going was was breaking down until the point when mike is breaking down and then his the electric the electric sound starts to break apart and then comes back as the hero sort of rises you know and it's like all that stuff is again with these with these composers it's amazing because they're friends and and they they started working before before we started shooting the movie right so you have just this mass of material that we had to work with as demos i work with their tracks as as the temp music which is incredible last question are you ready can you name me one thing that you are very proud of with this film either something you did or something i somebody else did i want to start with paul jesus <laughs> yeah you're welcome buddy i can't say one thing i mean i have to go back to the crowds because that was the hardest thing to do and it was all hands on deck all of us had a role in that it goes back to matt wanting us to be involved in sound early on in the picture edit which just affected how he approached things and made room for sounds to, to play a role. And then, you know, Brendan did a whole bunch of sourcing and cutting. And so we had the, the massive weight of crowd that we needed. And then, you know, Matt did so much work weaving things in and out with Graham in the mix. And of course, Martin and I collaborated on the, on the loop group as well. So yeah, it's not one thing, but this one big thing I'm for sure. That's yeah. great. Anybody else have anything to add? I mean, you know, and if it isn't too broad of a an answer, I just I'm just super proud of the dialogue track in general. It's the dialogue track that I'm the most proud of. Paul Ledson, the production sound mixer, just did superb recordings. Brent Pickett, the dialogue editor, did a fantastic job. And then of course Chan, he mixes di dialogue in such a really beautiful, transparent way. But the main I mean, the main thing is just being able to stand behind every line, pretty much. There's one production line that sounds maybe a little crunchy out of the whole movie and you know a huge part of that is is you know we, we've we've done a, f a film with sean before the nest he has this very this verite style and he is the, the the filmmaker that i've worked with the most who he will only use adr if it if it's successful 100 percent to him if that he if he has any doubt about adr not working it goes and you know we we all work with program makers and filmmakers nowadays who, who say, oh, you know, we don't want to use ADR. We, we're not sure about it. But then they have a line change or, or an ad line that they want to go in that they feel is important for them. And then they'll end up using it anyway, whether or not it's entirely successful. The brilliant thing about Sean is that he has a plan B. You know, all his eggs aren't in that basket of that that ADR line. He, if, if it doesn't work, he'll, th he'll think of an alternative if the ADR isn't successful for him. We watched the Atmos mix at Dolby. I will pay you the compliment from me of like the max, the maximum appreciation. There are ad lines that we needed to put into this movie to, to clarify certain things that were, had been taken out. They are 
imperceptible. Like I've never had more successful ad lines in my life. And I think it's because you work hard enough to do them and you don't just like, ah, whatever, like ADR it over his shoulder when he's leaving the room. It's like we created space for it, got it, cut it. And it's like, like the, there's a couple of little lines in there. You know, the ones like that are sort of like on people's backs and stuff. I am shocked. Like you cannot even alone in a theater, I, you can't hear it. And I just think it's like the most exciting thing when ADR is not ADR, it's just DR. Well, you'll be shocked to learn that the cast was very, very good at ADR. I think it's honestly, it's, it's recording these things well and everything. Like I really, I don't know. The dialogue is so good. And there's moments in the movie where dialogue is the only thing playing and it's so exciting. I think the best thing these guys did, and I'm really proud of the, of my part of it, but I think the coolest part of the movie is the Ric Flair sequence and the montage leading into it. So the overall concept for me of the edit was always like, I always try to think of a thing. And the thing in this movie is that I wanted it to all feel like a memory, right? Because it's like, it's kind of like all from the end, like thinking back about loss and everything. Because the greatest challenge of doing a real, like a biopic or something is that if anyone is so inclined, they can know what happened, right? So you need to make the experience of watching it interesting. And it can't just be like, well, guess what? This guy, this happened. And you're like, oh yeah, I, re I remember that, you know, or whatever. And like, it's in all the press, like this happens to this guy, whatever. So you really need to make the experience, the, the feature, not, not the event. And so that sequence feels the most like mashed magic, weird, like, bleedy gooey experience of of feeling and it tells so much story and it's and and the fact that we then like elevated it with the sound mix sound effects like the way all of it works i just think that sequence is like a real chef's kiss i thought you were gonna say the uh little cheesy 80s whoosh that i put in they're, a little 8-bit we needed to perfect. have that they're per can i get I, so I watched, I've watched the movie with people now a few times and they love it. It's like, you hear like this, like, it's almost like a satisfied amusement, you know? And that was like a risky thing that we did. Like there's some shit in this movie that I'm like, are we actually like, I, I had to use, I used stock avid transitions that I had to re like, you couldn't redo them. I had to do them in 4k on the on, like and deliver them as final to the grade because they can't recreate them and that shit makes me excited and then when paul's like whoosh, 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 like yeah it's like no it, they wouldn't work without that you know and that's the thing it's like the concert is is the experience it's so cool i almost cheered at all those transitions man i gotta tell you they're <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah. amazing yeah. they're wild i love them and it, it lets you have fun like there's, there's moments in this movie where you laugh while you're sad. And I think it's like a really cool effect and the ability to like, let it all play is really fun. Uh, my favorite thing was the palette of wrestling hits. It's a wrestling movie. So you know that you're going to need to do wrestling hits. And it was really important to us that those be original and they also be authentic. Like if Matt Hannum ever found out that we were using sound effects, library hits, he'd disown us and never use us ever again. So Paul and I and Matt Chan too were really set on this idea like how are we going to as as Paul spoke about earlier how are we going to get the physical space you know that has that kind of flap of a room where we can record that how are we going to get a mic set up where and a ring set up where we can get this multi mic perspective and we were so lucky when we first heard these production recording tracks because Hannah had told us he's like this guy is crazy like this guy's putting mics everywhere and i remember at one point he's like he's putting a mic under the ring and i was like he's putting a mic under the ring and he's like yeah he's putting a mic under the ring and that that turned out to be like an old trick that this guy was clearly doing his research they would mic under the ring or on the ring so that they could then in certain instances depending on where the wrestling match was would project the bumps from the wrestling ring through the actual sound system so he'd clearly like done his research and figured this out and put a mic directly under the ring on the frame of where the metal and the wood planks flex together. So he had an MS stereo recording kit in the deep stage to get you that really wide perspective, because in this film, there's some super wide perspectives. Then he had a mid-distant one 
that's right in the middle. Then he had one beside the ring and then he had one under the ring. So it's like, we got that. And it's like, okay, you have the building blocks to make the authentic sound. You have all these training matches. Like there's a lot of stuff we couldn't use because it had crowd on it and you could only use it for that shot, you know, if it, if it was a reaction or something. But then there were these training montages that Hannah was speaking about that was like one of his favorite sequences. I and mean, I think it was for all of us, but it was also the gold mine for us because there was no crowd. It was just Kevin doing his thing. And that was like the basis of all the wrestling sounds. And you can always cool. fill it in and add extra layers. Like once we knew like, oh, it's like a metal frame with wood planks flexing on it. Then, you know, we started to look for, okay, what other physical things can we record that have that interaction of those two materials? And like, lucky for me, like my front door on my condominium complex is like a wood door with like a metal frame. So you're a thing middle of the night when no one's around, just banging it and trying to get different reactions and things like that. We were super lucky that Paul had done those incredible recordings. And then furthermore, we have to give credit to Graham Rogers who mixed it because he showed so much restraint. Like when you're editing, I always wanted to go a little bit further with, you know, we're being real, but come on, like, let's give this some guts. And he showed so much restraint in terms of doing what Matt was talking about, where the sync's kind of off. And then the majority of the sound you're hearing is that delayed slap, the reaction of the physical space, the reverb of it, not the head itself. So it's this really like, and that's how it sounds. But for an editor, it's super hard to kind of commit to that. And I didn't, I feel like we didn't go that far with it. And then to hear it mixed like that, you're like, no, that's, that's how it should be. But it, it needs restraint in order to pull it off. So I'm super proud of, of the sound effects side for, for going that far with it and having that authentic and original set of sounds. I'd just like to say I'm proud of the collaboration and it's really cool to have come up with everyone here in different ways and that we get to have such a deep connection uh, with trust and being involved from such an early early point uh, in the process and it really makes for a better soundtrack. So it's great, it's special. Well, thank you everybody. That was great. Have a great rest of your day, I guess. And, Thanks, Rod. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty nice. Thanks, Thanks for the you stop. guys.